Brian Crabtree here, the HouseDog.com Real Estate Show, April 8th, the week coming up. We're going to talk about the five states that have the highest foreclosure numbers in the country, and South Carolina is in that list. It may shock you where we are, actually. Plus, the Biden administration talking about rental limit caps, meaning they'll cap your potential rental income on certain rental properties throughout the country. What impact does that have in South Carolina? Plus, shocking new numbers of the Charleston real estate market, Mount Pleasant broken down, Somerville broken down, and we'll do Charleston as a whole. All of that coming up as we talk about real estate today on a brief but very information-packed Brian Crabtree and House Dog dot com real estate show. So let's get to the numbers here. Uh, let me minimize myself and let's go first uh, to the housing market stats for Charleston. We'll start with the Charleston market at large. Here's the latest graph available. It's a seller's market in Charleston at large. The median sold home price for March last month was $538,953. If you owned a home, from March 2023 until eight, uh, March 2024, you made fifty, uh, almost fifty thousand dollars, forty-six thousand dollars appreciation of the median sales price in the Charleston market at large, nine point four percent in one of the toughest real estate years since the Great Recession. That's a pretty strong number. There are markets in Florida and other parts of the country that are starting to see some easing back of the actual pricing of properties, especially in condos and townhomes, resort properties. We are simply not seeing that here in the Charleston market. The supply-demand imbalance from an economic standpoint in the Charleston market is uh, outrageous, meaning not enough homes, way too many buyers, and there's a whole lot of cash. So let's go now to the Somerville market. We'll get to Mount Pleasant in just a second. Uh, the price change in um, Somerville from March 2023 to March 2024, $307. So again, one of the most challenging real estate markets since the Great Recession. We still saw a very, very moderate amount of appreciation bringing the median sold price in Somerville to $384,775. Now, what does this mean? Still a seller's market. It just means that there's more of a supply balance in Somerville. This is because of new homes. Somerville is the only kind of swath of land in the Charleston area where you can look. I was out with a buyer uh, last week and, you know, there are homes available around the median sold price still in Somerville. You can go to Nexton, you can go to uh, Cane Bay. There are other neighborhoods. There's a new neighborhood in Ravenel, but still Dorchester County called Homecoming. Uh, and all points in between, you can find homes sub $400,000. So that's keeping the pricing in Somerville a little bit more in check. That means you can get top dollar for your home if you want to sell it right now, but it's not like what we're going to show you in Mount Pleasant where the prices are getting well, outrageous. <laughs> I don't know how else to put it, but there's something really weird about the housing market conditions in Mount Pleasant. If you'll look at the top before we get to this number at the bottom, that almost makes you gag uh, unless you're a seller or you're sitting on a bunch of property in Mount Pleasant, then you're really, really happy. It's a buyer's market in Mount Pleasant. Now, that's really misleading. So let's go back to 2023 till now. If you owned a home in Mount Pleasant in the median or average price range, means median means half the home sold for more, half the home sold for less, right? So that's not really the average. The average is, I think, in the 800 and something thousand dollar range. But that number is going through the roof as we speak because uh, homes that are interior homes with 2,500 to 3,000 square feet from Dunes West to Carolina Park all the way back to the bridge. And if you're lucky back to the bridge, you don't get too close to the bridge for this price. Right around a million bucks. Like to find one at 900000 right now is almost unheard of. Million eighty seven thousand five hundred dollars that was fixed from February to March. So that didn't change from February of, of twenty four to March of twenty four. But if you owned the home for the last twelve months, you made sixty seven thousand five hundred dollars. That's that's like a half of a household income in Mount Pleasant. That's a lot of money just sitting on a home and living in it. Now, if you're trying to buy into the market right now, there's good news and bad. The bad news is is that most everything that's for sale is pricey and increasing because there's not a whole lot for sale, but there's also not a lot of buyer demand right now proportionate to the amount of new listings on the market in Mount Pleasant. So this must mean prices are going to come down, right? Not exactly. Most likely not. 
because what we're seeing with calling it a buyer's market is we're finally getting some inventory and the prices are becoming more negotiable. The days on the market are a little bit longer because there's a lot of people coming into this market paying cash for houses in the uh, in Mount Pleasant and in greater Charleston County area. And that's why we're seeing this, this meter. It's the only section of Charleston that says it's a buyer's market, I think is a little bit misleading because right now what we're seeing is that Mount Pleasant is starting to find a balance between these excessive price increases, which arguably in some parts of the market were double digits. Just because the median price went up 9 or 10%, that's more of a market health dynamic. If you really look at the average price, we probably saw more like 14% appreciation year over year, which is what we saw in the February chart year over year. And we saw more of a, of, of a seller's market ind indicative of the marketplace in Mount Pleasant in, um, in February of 2024. What I think is going to happen this year so I think we're going to see more and more of these people putting a million four home up for a million eight, and occasionally someone might get it, but more than likely going to see price reductions. It's going to really mess up the data because a lot of people now are getting ridiculous in what they're asking. The best way to get the most money for a house in any part of the market right now is to hit that mark, that price trend analysis like I do when I sit down with a seller and say, well, for the last six months, this is what the trending has been doing every month. So if it's going up 1% and the last house, just like yours, sold for a million, then arguably you might could list that for a million fifty or even a million one and get a full price offer or multiple offers because you have a unique property and sell way over the last house just like yours, which might have also been way over the last house just like theirs and yours. What we're seeing a lot now is people are putting their homes up at 1.4 and 1.5 million. So it's skewing in Mount Pleasant and it's skewing the market when they really should be 1.1, 1 1.2, 1, 1 1 or even 950. So we're seeing market data skewed. It's not really a buyer's market in Mount Pleasant, even though it kind of statistically looks like that. So that is kind of the lay of the land. With interest rates fluctuating everywhere, people think, well, I'm just going to wait. I'm just going to wait. I'm just going to wait. Listen, there are 50% more home buyers on the market now than we saw at the beginning of the Great Recession. We were building 1.4 million homes at the beginning of the Great Recession. We were uh, outpacing household creation. Now we are under, I think it's 900,000 New home starts this year projected. Don't hold me to that number. We're, we're, we're generating about 1.1 to 1.2 million new household in creation this year based on my last estimate. And so what we're seeing right now is even though prices are rising and rates are rising, we are not keeping up with household creation commensurate with the destruction of houses through natural disaster and fire and flood. Uh, and the household creation rate. So you got to take a couple 300,000 houses a year out of the housing stock just to accommodate for fire, flood, natural disaster. And then you've got to add the household creation number, 1.4 million or whatever that is. We're nowhere near that in new home starts. So we are, as we move forward, the, the interesting issue that we have going on now is that we are, are becoming, we, we are creating more households then we are creating new homes to buy. So the rental market is absorbing all of that, about a million new apartments uh, to start this year. So that will absorb a lot of the existing marketplace and all of that that's lacking in the new homes market. But people that want to buy are getting stuck rent renting. And so what is that creating? Well, let's, let's minimize me and maximize the data. Let's go to the Joe Biden plan. And I'm not here to do politics on this. I'm just here to talk about what this means. So Biden to cap rent rises at 10% in a new affordable housing ploy. The White House is unveiling a plan that could stop landlords upcharging on millions of homes, and they're doing this to examine how to tackle rental cost increases as the U.S. is facing an affordable housing crisis. Now, that's true. We are facing a significant affordable housing crisis. The Washington Report, uh, Post reported last Monday that the administration is going to announce a cap on affordable housing uh, unit increases uh, today sometime. Uh, so if you're watching this video uh, in delay, this may have already been announced. And this will mostly impact homes that are in some way subsidized by uh, government contracts. So like if you've got certain kinds of Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, 
uh, FHA HUD type backing or you've got affordable housing requirements in your in your rental portfolio, they may put a cap on that. The other thing that they might start doing too that could have an impact on the housing market, I have not read this, but HUD puts out a HUD FMR which is the fair market rent, and they update that based on market rents everywhere. So, for instance, in Dorchester County, uh, or let's say Charleston County, because I just looked that up for an investment potential uh, purchase uh, last week, there was about a 20, I think it was $2,432 was the HUD voucher allotment for a four-bedroom house in Charleston County. So what you're seeing is if you look at the $2,400, with the exception of one neighborhood, if you'll email me, I'll tell you where it is in Charleston County. New construction under 400000 where the numbers work either for investment or for purchase to live in. All right, other than that, there's nothing that I can find that really matches the HUD FMR. So the, the thing that the, the Biden administration could do, which would be scary, is they could cap the HUD FMR, which has been going up like, 15 or 20 percent each year for the last three or four years. Uh, the fair market rent analysis is what the maximum voucher payment can be on government voucher tenants. So basically, you've got tenants that have a voucher for, I don't know, 2400 bucks, And they go out to the market. They look for a rental for 2400 bucks, already very difficult to find. And they go and they take – the landlord says, I, I take these in some of the properties I manage and, and, and operate – and we take the voucher money, so we have a guaranteed payment every month from the government, the housing authority of the local community, subsidized by HUD, funded by HUD. And they buy, they, they then pay some co-payment, and they pay their utilities, or sometimes the government pays those. Well, that's very hard now. There's like a 1,000 people waiting in Dorchester County right now to find a property that matches their voucher. So the problem is that the HUD housing programs aren't working anymore because people get a voucher. They have nowhere to live, so they're having to pile in with family or lose their voucher, which takes years on a waiting list to get. And I'm not getting into the politics of this. I'm just saying this is part of the overall housing market because there's so many people moving to a place like Charleston that the self-paying tenants are driving up the price of rent so that it might that $2,400 voucher might be competing in a market that's now become $2,700 or $2,800. So what the Biden administration is saying they're going to do is start to try to mix up in there and affect where they can uh, HUD valuations, subsidized housing programs. Uh, if someone built an apartment complex and said, hey, you know, we're going to put uh, 100 units up and we're going to make 30% of them affordable housing, then they may cap the rents in the entire complex by whether it's legal or not, it's a different story. And I don't think that that's good for the housing market. I think the policy that's missing in Charleston is that we need to be doing some things from a tax base incentive to incentivize condo and townhome developments and to make it less incentivized to build apartment complexes. Two reasons. One, we need another apartment complex in Charleston County or really the greater Charleston Tri-County area like I need a hole in the head. We don't need this many apartments. They're just going up everywhere. And I know some folks may not like that because that affects private property rights. But as a policy, I'm not saying we keep people from building those apartments. I'm saying that we make the tax rates and the, and the millage rates and things that we're charging on that kind of product, we make the policy such that it's more attractive to build residential, single-family, attached homes like condos and townhomes and less attractive to build massive apartment complexes. Uh, the reason that from a tax base that, that, that that's more incentivized right now, the apartment complexes, is it costs less money for fire, flood, water, because you have one unit, one owner that has multiple units, and it spreads out the city services or the county services. So we, we need to be creating more single-family attached and detached houses to keep up with the demand. That's the policy from a governmental standpoint that will keep the rental rates from continuing to go sky high as they've been doing. I, I don't think manipulating manipulating the market is a great idea. And finally, let's talk about the housing markets with the five highest rates of foreclosure. I just get these things in my inbox and I started looking. Well, number one in that list, I'll start at the top, South Carolina, one in 2,248 homes. Now let's put this into some context here. If, if we apply that number to the Charleston area, it's just shy of a 300,000 housing stock, that means that roughly we've got what? 300 homes in foreclosure, something like that. I, I think that's the number. So it's not a big alarming number. That's about normal. 
So what we're saying is that South Carolina has gotten back to a normal foreclosure rate that we saw 2019 and prior after we kind of burned off the Great Recession. Uh, Interesting to note, Delaware, Florida, Ohio, and Connecticut are in the top five. Florida is starting to see some issues with its housing market. I was just down in Florida on vacation for spring break. And I uh, down there, you kind of get media from the area. It kind of trickles in like media does. You can't avoid it. And so what I saw was that the, the con- some of the condo market is starting to get uh, weaker. They're reducing prices more. There's a lot of things going on there in the Florida market that could be coming our way. But I also know that Florida has a more extreme version of pricing and affordability and cost of living than even Charleston does. We're moving toward what Florida is now really dealing with, which is it's a, somebody retire, fixed income. They're not what you might call on the upper end of middle class or into the upper class. It's becoming increasingly difficult for someone to even think about moving to Florida and surviving unless they're in a mobile home park somewhere inland, which kind of takes away what's driven Florida for decades as the place, the sunshine state to go to retire and live out your golden years. What we're seeing in Charleston is we're kind of becoming that destination. We're becoming that halfback opportunity. You're not all the way to Florida, but you're halfway back near to home, near to family up north. And so we're seeing a lot of people move into this marketplace, and they are by high demand with low supply and low infrastructure, unfortunately. We're creating price increases that are quite uh, amazing in a 7% plus or minus interest rate environment. We, We were as high as in the eights at one point late last year. Uh, I do expect interest rates to fall uh, later this year. And if that happens, then we'll be giving you even more bigger, more enormous graphs of price increases in Charleston. I don't see this market slowing down in terms of value and equity until at least next year. And I wouldn't see any kind of depreciation scenario. We had a massive jobs report just last week that was like blew the doors off of expectations for whatever reason that is. As long as that's Going on, you add up like Boeing and Volvo and the medical uh, uh, aspects of Charleston. There's like 30,000 high-paying jobs here in that category alone, not counting Mercedes-Benz and all those other Bosch and that, that maybe employ 1,000, 2,000 people. We got 30,000 jobs here that 15 years ago we didn't have. And that is exponentially increasing people that move here to work for Boeing in their prime years of earning. Their family moves here to retire to be near their family and their grandparents grandchildren. There's a lot of that going on here. And so we we can't totally quantify what impact and for how long that's going to have on the Charleston market. But I would say this market will outperform the rest of the country and even some of our more competitive markets like Florida for at least the next decade. And I'm usually more bearish on markets in this condition. I'm not saying we couldn't see prices fall at some point, but if you're waiting on that to happen, I think you probably lose in the marketplace. If you'd like a personal analysis on your property, want to find out more information about what the market's doing, get pre-qualified, we can we can actually get you pre-approved, so to speak, without even pulling your credit. It won't be an inquiry on your credit report. I can explain that to you on the phone. So there's a lot of ways to check your temperature in today's market, the value of your home, the value of houses you're looking at, uh, your credit. And I'm telling you, if you're thinking about buying a year from now, now is the time to pull your credit so that we can get your credit score as high as possible because you get in the 800s. I love pricing out mortgages in this environment for people with an 805 credit score because their rate is so much cheaper than everybody else's. So whether you're buying, you need to get pre-qualified, or you're thinking about selling a house, you just go to housedog.com or you can call me at 843-343-4141. And thanks for watching the housedog.com real estate show. We do it every Monday except holidays. Have a great week.